I am late to my March expenses review. Not doing very well here, am I? I was away, as you know, um, so I didn't really have the opportunity to record this. And also, just distracted, and I hadn't got all my finances in order for the end of the month. So um, I want to add. A f I'm going to add a few things here, but then I also want to talk about self-assessment because. At the point where I am recording this, we are also three or four days into self-assessment or into the new tax year, should I say, which begins on the 6th of April. And I just want to do a quick overview of that because I suppose I have two financial years. I have the calendar year, which is January to December. And then I have the tax year because I'm self-employed and I have to do self-assessment. And it's really weird seeing the difference between the two years. So my costs and my expenses and my uh, the money that I've made looks really different on both years because some of the things that I did last year happened later in the year so they so they're not on my previous self assessment but they're on this one so for the last few years my income has slowly been going upwards and that does apply for uh both of my um financial calendars so first of all I'm going to get march out of the way and then I'm going to tackle the self assessment um review separately uh, yeah, because as well as self-assessment, there are lots of expenses that I can claim against against my work, against my business, and against all my side hustles, which I can't do with a, a calendar year, which basically covers everything. So March wasn't a busy month, um, and in terms of money, it was cheaper because I was away. Yes, I spent petrol, but I wasn't buying food and what have you, and I was away for the last six days of March, which doesn't sound like a lot, but can make a bit of a difference. So one bill that did, one of my annual bills that did come up was my breakdown cover for my car. That has actually gone down three pounds this year. So I use a company called Emergency Assist. I've always gone with the smaller breakdown brands, never had a problem. And I've been with these guys on and off for on and off for six or seven years I've gone away from them when I've, there's been a cheaper offer from someone else and I've come back to them um, so last year it cost me £46 that's an all-inclusive breakdown service so that will cover me for breakdowns away from home getting me somewhere safe getting my car to a garage if I'm a long way from home it includes home starts all the biz so that's now £43 for the year and that has all been paid up so that's one more bill I don't have to worry about for the year. Food uh, in March, uh, we had quite a good month actually for cashback apps and for yellow stickers. So my physical spend and the way I work it on my spreadsheets is all the fo food goes in for the month. Anything that doesn't get eaten or opened, like I might put a tin in my stocks, I might put something into the freezer and not use it that month. I then roll that onto the next month. I only look at what I physically eat, what I've opened or physically used during the month. And then anything that I haven't physically opened or used then gets pushed to the next month. And if I use it next month, that goes on to next month's budget. So I end up with not a, this is what I spent this month, but this is what I've eaten the value of. And then at the end of the year, by the end of the year, you've got a whole year's of worth of what I actually ate. And it's why stockpiling in some small way, I have a, a spare stock of stuff. So if I see six tins of beans really cheap, I'll take them all because they'll sit in the cupboard for a long time. And that way, when months become lean, if I have a bad month income wise or there's nothing cheap on the shelves, because I'm waiting for the yellow sticker bubble to burst, um, it is more expensive than it was um, because as the percentages have gone up in terms of what food costs, those yellow stickers also go up. So the food shop is still not as cheap. 
I'm having to be even more careful about what I buy, what I make. I cook from scratch most of the time, so most of the ingredients I'm looking for are things that I can mix up. So I buy a lot of veg fresh vegetables. Um, I will buy a reasonable amount of um, ready-cooked deli-type meats because they tend to be cheaper on discounts. But I'll pick up whatever's cheap enough and find a way of using it. So my food, my actual food spend for March was £15.77 and we rolled over quite a bit and of course there was a whole week when I wasn't around so I didn't do any shopping at all. Um, what else did I do? What did I earn? Um, I earned £264 doing surveys and market research so that was a good month. Uh, my YouTube income was down this month so the previous month had looks like a fluke it really does look like a fluke I was averaging when I started doing this I thought I might average 140 a month from YouTube and then I had a a, a bizarrely good um, I think it was February was a really good month and then March has been kind of back to normal and I thought it was going to end up being 140 and then I had my first super thanks so thank you to you you know who you are if you're watching um, and that boosted me up to £169.83. Uh, so thank you for the super thanks. And if you want to give a super thanks, um, I have now um, added them to my channel. I didn't add them very long ago. And someone's already taken advantage of that. So thank you so much for that. That really makes a huge difference. So we are just up on our on my expected average. And that month where I had a, a really good income from YouTube is because I was posting every day. And it wasn't because I was trying to post every day. There was just a lot going on. I wanted to do a range of long posts and then much shorter ones. And I was just trying to work out what worked. Posting every day does bring the money in because at the end of the day, it's about adverts shown, people watching whilst they're watching the vlog. And that's where the money comes from. So by posting every other day, there's potentially half the month where I have no videos coming out and therefore nobody's watching. Um, so I need to, I don't want to post just for the sake of making money, it has to be my life, it has to be what it's always been. So I, if I do post every day, it'll be because there's a lot going on, I'm trying to cram things in, in a, um, a chronological sense because I could just string out all the videos to one every other day but then somewhere along the line the chronology stops making sense because I record every week and I'll record something every day and then jigsaw them together into um, you know 30 minute posts that cover my entire week so that's really how it tends to work at the moment but there will be individual ones like if I specifically want to talk about the, the pension I've just set up or the ISAs I've just set up, or something's happened with Universal Credit, or there's a tutorial I really want to do for you, I'll do those as separates. So I think for the moment I'm still going to be doing every other day, so I am, I'm going to imagine that £140 a month is going to be my average from YouTube at the moment, which is, you know, every penny counts at the end of the day, much as I would love it to be much higher. It is what it is. Um, what else do I have here? Oh yes, I had my renewal quote through on my home insurance, which I think I've already mentioned in a previous vlog recently. That will be paid out, I think, around the 20th of April, so I'm hanging on to the last minute for that. That's gone up by £25. It's a bit of a pain because it's tied to my rental agreement. I have to use the company and the policy that is tied to my rental agreement and to the the company that manages the flat um, I don't know what the rules and regulations are on that but if I if I hadn't accepted that I wouldn't have got this flat and the nightmare I had getting this place or, or getting this place and not getting other places as well it wasn't one of those things that I could negotiate on so to speak I could just say oh I won't take the flat because I would have ended up homeless um, and I'm not actually sure in that case whether my home insurance policy is competitive or not. 
So I will, from the end of April, I will be paying 225 a, a year. Is that good? Is that bad? I'm not sure. I don't know. I've never, ever had to buy home insurance myself. And when I've lived in other places where there hasn't been a policy attached to the rental, I've just not bothered because nearly all my stuff is old. It's not worth anything. Most of my gadgets are at least three years old, so they wouldn't have covered them anyway. So I never bother. But because this is um, a contents policy that partly covers the fixtures and fittings that belong to the landlord if I break them, like if I break the cooker or smash a window or spill bleach all over the carpet, that will be covered. I don't have to replace it. Um, the landlord doesn't have to pay for it. And it kind of makes sense. I know that some people, th people think that's a rip-off because I'm tied to that policy, but, uh, you know, and they would say, well, he should have his own contents policy. I don't know how it works. All I know is that's what I'm stuck with and I have to get on with it. Um, so yeah, I will be paying that towards the end of April. Uh, so I probably won't need to talk about that one again. Uh, but bills have been all over the place this year. So a lot of stuff has gone up, some of it incrementally, some of it enormously. And it just seems to be the, the sign of the times at the moment that every all your annual bills will just go up every year from now on. The council tax has gone up. The car insurance was an absolute joke this year. The water rates have gone up a tiny amount. Um, I've put my gas and electric direct debit up um, voluntarily because I wanted to make sure I was well covered. So far this year, and this is a prediction up to the end of April, which is when most of my bills, I think when all of my annual bills will have been paid for the year, um, it's uh, it will have gone up £188.85 on last year's annual bills uh, across across the, the, the floor, so to speak. But I have also saved £50.54 on some things going down. One of those is my business insurance, which I had my renewal through. I knew it was going to go up and it's already too expensive and it's gone up to £337 to cover my little home business, which doesn't even trade with real human beings you know, in photography studios anymore, and it's just ridiculous. It's, it's a waste of my money, it's a waste of time. I can't reduce the policy because public liability or personal indemnity, I can't remember which, is tied to all their policies, and I think that's where the money goes. So I shopped around, I found a policy with direct line, which will cover me for the simple things. It'll cover my tools, um, so I have like a semi-industrial sewing machine, so I'm covered if that goes down or something happens to that. It covers me for the value of my stock, uh, which is completed garments and things that I've made that are ready to sell. And it covers me for all the fabrics that I have in stock. Um, what else does it cover me for? I think that's pretty much it. That's all I really need. I, my, my business has pared down quite a bit since I moved here because I don't have access to photography studios and stuff anymore. So I'm not out working with clients anymore. I'm just a little home business. And the difference in the insurance, you know, you just couldn't turn it down. So 337 this year to renew with Simply Business. Direct line, I can get my insurance for 69 quid for the year. I, I, I can't, you know, how can you not justify that? I just need to cover the basics of my business now. So if something happens to the flat, or, you know, I get robbed of the flat burns down, whatever. I'm covered for the basics, which are the stuff that I've made, the stuff that I have to make things with, the tools, and tech. Yeah, I've covered up to £2,000 worth of tech. And the only reason I've done that, again, is because I have a brand new laptop now. I think I don't even covered it for two grand. I think that might have been the minimum I could cover it for. But uh, it doesn't say... It doesn't say tech under a year old so I'm not sure I'll have to look at the the agreement for that but in any case I now have a brand new laptop that's only three months old I want to cover that and primarily I use that all for work now it's uh, and kind of everything is work now YouTube is now work um, I do all my, I sell online only so I need the laptop for my website and for my Etsy pages my Etsy online shops I have two of those and it covers me for making YouTube videos for my business channel and for this channel. So the laptop really is a business thing. I couldn't run my business without it. So I've allocated uh, the cover for that to, to the business. So 
the laptop and, and all the bits that go with it are now covered or will be covered uh, the policy doesn't uh, I think my simply business policy expires on I think it's again the 20 I think it might be the 22nd or the 21st of this month I'm gonna let that lapse and as soon as I've cleared my credit card bill for the end of April I'm going to buy that policy on the new credit card month and then I'll have to pay for it until the end of May. It'll be like 10 days of no cover. Touch word, I have never ever claimed on an insurance policy in my life. Personally, there's a lot of insurance policies I'd prefer to take the risk on not having, but it's really hard to avoid sometimes. You can't not have car insurance. I can't not have contents insurance. I don't feel that it's necessarily a good idea to not cover my business because the stock alone has a high value to it. In my terms, you know, the stock that I that I ha that I valued is a year's worth of income for me. So I don't really want to take that risk, and especially with the tools, if something happens to my sewing machine, how the hell do I replace a semi-industrial sewing machine um, out of pocket? So yeah, so that's uh, that, that's really kind of going into April. Uh, what else have I done? Um, yeah, I, I have a private pension now, so I now pay one hundred and ninety-two pounds a month into that. The government tops that up to two forty, and I chucked some savings at it before the end of this tax year, so that I was fully paid up for the 23-24 tax year even though I only took out the policy in January um, because I have no real, I mean I have the state pension but I have no real retirement fund so I want to catch up on that. So now I'm paying £192 a month into that and I've also just started a stocks and shares ISA as an additional, as an additional retirement backup but with emergency access to the money if I need it because I never know what's going to happen. And I'm paying, I'm just going to pay £25 a month into that and then top it up with chunks of money because I have long-term savings in locked accounts which is coming out and it needs to go somewhere. And I think you, because I'm using the ISA as a, a long-term like a retirement fund to run in tandem with my pension, I think that putting it into there is better than just sticking it into an easy access account and letting it sit there. I don't need to have that amount of money as easy access. I have my emergency savings fund. I have a car fund for in case something happens to my car, I need to replace it. Um, other repairs I can pay for day to day. I don't need to have huge chunks of money just floating around in, you know, savings accounts that are paying very average rates and the rates are going down again. So you know uh, you can't get, really get anything over five percent i've decided to stick with my tandem account which is now pi paying 4.90 i mean if you find another account that's higher there are some that are higher there's one that's 5.27 but when you look at over the course of a year when you look at the amount of money that i have in the savings and you give it the value of 4.90 interest to 5.27 it was only making a difference of about 25 quid a year. There was just not much point in, in changing over. So I'm going to leave it where it is and invest the bigger chunks that I don't need into the ISA where it's accessible if I need it. But the idea is that I don't touch it because it takes a little bit of that fear off me that, oh my God, if I lock away all my savings, like in the pension, and something happens, I'm done for. You've got to plan ahead. So those two are now regular expenses that go out, but I don't really think about them as being part of the budget because I could stop them at any time. I have very flexible policies where if I decide I can't pay a pension anymore or I can only pay £50 a month to a pension or I want to stop the stocks and shares ISA, I can, and there's no problem with any of that. So that's really where I am in terms of just my March budget and... Um, and the last of the big bills for the year, which is the contents insurance and the business insurance. Everything else is now paid up for the year. Everything is settled and now I'm just coasting through the year. My rent is uh, not a monthly thing. 
because when I moved in here I couldn't I didn't get credit clearance because my income is all over the place they gave me six months tenancy and I just paid for the whole thing at the beginning of the six months and then they put me on to after a couple of years they put me on to a one year contract because I was going to be staying but they let me pay into six monthly chunks I've never asked them if I can change it because if they did the credit checks again now I would still almost certainly fail because although my money has changed, I'm still not earning huge amounts of money. I earn enough to pay all my bills. I don't earn enough in the eyes of most people. In fact, I don't even earn enough in the eyes of Universal Credit, even though I earn enough to cover all my bills, all the things I want to. I'm not a big spender. I'd much rather save my money and spend it on stuff I don't need um, or don't want, should I say. I'm happy just paying for the needs, the things that have to be paid and having a little bit over to buy the odd thing. I'm not completely, I never buy anything for myself. That's not true. I do buy little things for myself, but I don't want for much and I don't want to spend lots of money on physical stuff that I buy. I'd rather have experiences and I'm quite happy with my quiet little life as it is. Um, but this year potentially has the possibility of being an even better year than last year. And last year was better than the year before. So we are incrementally climbing a ladder. Which, because I monitor everything on my spreadsheets, makes it quite interesting and quite exciting to see the progress that I'm making. And I'm doing all of that from being self-employed with side hustles. There's, n uh, there's no regular PAY work involved at all. And that's how I want to keep it. I don't want to be tied to a PAY job. I need the autonomy. I like the freedom. I like that I can go and visit family when I need to, which for me at the moment is eight weeks of the year. They live a long way away. I plan my trips and I don't want to be on a PAYE where I'm only allowed to take X number of days based on me being part-time or whatever. I just want to be able to say, right, I'm going down to my, my parents for two weeks. Anyone who would normally pay me for work that I was doing, I'm not doing the work, you don't pay me. I lose that little bit of money, but I have the freedom to do what I want. And I need that, having spent quite a lot of my life in nine to five jobs, where it wasn't even nine to five. I mean, sometimes I was working nine to nine. It was ridiculous. And I never want to go there again. So that's really the 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 normal kind of budget. That's that's where I am with that. I'm now going to have a look at my self-assessment and just get a feel for that. I mean, self-assessment is really easy for me every year, um, mostly because, again, I run it on spreadsheets and I keep a very tight ship on the spreadsheets, which means that when it comes to self-assessment time, it takes me about four hours to do my self-assessment. Everything is in the right columns. Everything is already divided up um, as I would report it on self-assessment. So I can look at the column and go, oh yeah, that's bank interest. Um, oh yeah, that's travel expenses. Um, that's that's office costs like stationery and buying cartridges for printers and things. Um, that's earnings from that. That's earnings from that. And it just goes straight in. And then I just double check the boxes and it's done. It's very simple. It's very easy but it requires good management throughout the year um, and you have to stay on top of it. You have to be really disciplined. Luckily for me, I love a spreadsheet. I love keeping the numbers up to date. I like knowing how well I am doing or where things are not doing as well. Why not? How can I change it? Or how can I improve in other areas to tip the balance? So my business doesn't make as much money as it did. The last few years have been hard but I have a bunch of side hustles uh, which are f definitely filling the gap because I'm actually better off than I was with the business was doing better. Um, but it's an incremental growth. I'm in no rush to get anywhere. I'm ticking my saving goal boxes and my aspirations future-wise. I've ticked boxes that I have had nagging at me for a long time, like the pension funds. Yes, I know it's not an enormous amount of money going in, but I can use their guesstimations on my paperwork to get a feel for how much I potentially may have when I retire. 
and to be honest with you it's more than I'm making now <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about that at all so right so I'm going to go and get myself organized with my self-assessment numbers um, because I haven't really really closely examined those I'd like to do a comparison for my self-assessment against my calendar year because I have my end of December figures and I'd like to see how that compares with the 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 three month the three and a bit month difference of being self-assessment because things did change quite a lot in those early months so I'll be back in a little bit and I will add that to the end of this video okay so here is my little roundup of the number differences between the calendar year the financial calendar year which is January to December and the tax year and the tax year runs from the 6th of April to the 5th of April and I suppose the main difference in all that is what is classed as uh, as taxable because I'm self-employed there are lots of things that I can claim back for against my business and there are a number of things in currently in my my income streams which are which I don't need to declare and the things that don't need to be declared include um, untaxable uh, or untaxed benefits so what was previously working tax credits and is now universal credit. Um, I've not claimed universal credit before when I've been doing self-assessment. This will be my first and probably only year. So I'm going to add alongside here the differences so you can see the difference in, in the incomes. So I don't know whether I go in, whether when I go into my self-assessment I need to declare that I've had universal credit I'm assuming there is a connection between the two systems because with working tax credits I never had to. I never had to say, oh I've had working tax credits. The system just knew because it was all part of the same system and it was talking, they were, all the departments were talking to each other. I don't think they do that anymore so I don't know what's going to happen there. So pretty much what I end up with is a self-assessment that's that I don't have to pay any tax on because of the amount of things which are undeclared so <clears throat> on my calendar year um, my universal credit stroke working tax credits uh, at the moment is looking like it's going to come up at about three and a half thousand for the calendar year because it goes back to last April which was when I was still on working tax credits and then I've moved to universal credit uh, that's showing up as um, just over £4,000 and that's undeclared money there are other things which are not declared so there is um, a column which I call or a sum which I call government money and that is the cost of living the cost of living crisis payments that were made to people on lower incomes that's the money that was given um, against energy bills because it's all coming in to my bank accounts I add it to my income streams because it is physical money that came in now the energy money goes in would have gone directly into my energy provider account without Fox the market but because of that it means that my direct debits could stay lower because I have very low usage anyway it was pretty much paying for all my energy in that time so I classed that as adding to my income streams because with the high bills um, but I wasn't having to pay having to pay it personal income so that's where I had a big old clear out last year of, of stuff in my flat that I didn't need anymore I sold some of it on 
um, on eBay, some of it on Etsy if it was vintage stuff and I also sold some of my old clothes on Vinted. So for my calendar year that came in at just over £1,300 for the year. That personal money also includes gifted money so it'll be a, like a small check from my parents at Christmas and birthdays. Um, anything that I don't need to declare, declare like I had a um, I had a credit card with Tesco last year which I thought I closed years ago but it was actually a dormant account or there was something left over from it and Tesco contacted me and said there was £12.77 in interest on it that was due back to me and they were closing this this historic account so little things like that as I say personal vintage items sometimes I sell old DVDs books of mine anything that's personal that it's my own stuff. It's stuff I've owned for years and I'm just selling my old junk basically. Um, some income which has uh, gone up. Surveys is up on the self-assessment year to the calendar year. Um, it's not a lot. It's gone up by about 50 quid, something like that. My bills overall the difference between the calendar year and the self-assessment year is different. So in my calendar year I spent more money going out than I did in my self-assessment year. But my income in on my calendar year was slightly lower than my self-assessment year. And that's because January, February and March have had different figures so my calendar year it's January, February, March at the beginning of the year and for self-assessment it's at the end of the year because obviously the self-assessment year starts in at the end of the first week of April. So as you can see my my income for the calendar year was just under 14,500 last year for self-assessment, it's fifteen and a half thousand or thereabouts, and my gross taxable income. Uh, so th there's that fifteen and a half thousand on self-assessment, which theoretically would would mean that I was in a tax in the in the twenty percent tax bracket. But because I have expenses going out for my business, like I'm buying fabrics, and there's mileage for. Um, some of the cleaning work I, I do a small amount of mileage each week and that's claimable at 45 pence per mile and even on small amounts of mileage that makes a difference there's the undeclared and declarable income as well from um, working tax credits and universal credits and government money blah blah personal stuff whatever so the undeclarable income against that fifteen and a half thousand is six thousand eight hundred and forty one on my spreadsheet as it is now which means I only have a gross taxable income of just over £10,000 so once again I am under that tax bracket and that's that's what a huge difference being self-employed can make if you there are all sorts of things which you can claim as expenses for your business legitimately there will always be things that you don't have to declare personal items which are not considered uh, business. Um, I do pay my national insurance voluntarily every year so I'm fully paid up for my national insurance to date and provided I carry on paying as I am now until my official retirement I will then be eligible for the full state pension because for much of my working life I have been in PAYE work and all the time I've been self-employed I have always paid my national insurance predominantly because it's compulsory, it's not been a voluntary thing, voluntary payment. There were a couple of years, I can't remember when, a few years ago or so, where they allowed people on lower incomes to voluntarily choose to pay their national insurance and what they found is that nobody paid it because they couldn't afford to, because they were self-employed and on lower incomes. And the knock-on effect of that, of course, is that none of these people will get their state pension. They're probably not paying into private pensions or have other investments or savings either. 
so you could see that if they continue to allow that system to go on you were going to have a massive problem with people who had no personal retirement income but also no state income um, no state pension or, or a very small state pension because they weren't paying the national insurance and it's pretty much what the national insurance pays for is your state pension so if you don't pay it you will get either none at all or you will get a lesser state pension and it's already small enough as it is so I've always been happy to pay my national insurance to get that um, there's a lot of speculation about whether that the state pension will exist by the time I retire which is in best part of 20 years anyway and if it doesn't what the hell happens to all our national insurance money um, I don't know anyway so even though I'm on a lower income I have always voluntarily paid I have always paid my national insurance and that is one thing about self-employment is that it is one of those things that you still have to pay as a rule depending on your income so that's really just a little basic overview of the difference between my calendar year and my tax year and you know it doesn't make a whole difference overall it's money in it's money out and it's looking at those figures I tend to so I'll work on the self-assessment obviously because those are the rules and that's what I need to do but as a general rule I will always use my calendar year my January to December year as my ballpark for ins and outs each year that's the one I tend to work off but obviously I have to have the self-assessment because I have to do those declarations so I have that spreadsheet anyway but it's interesting to see the differences those few months at the beginning of the month and then one at the end it's interesting to see how those bills cause those fluctuations but I've you know I've put those figures up on here for you so you can get a bit of a feel for the differences that that makes and some of them will be up some of those numbers will be down it's just a little bit of interesting addition to this vlog um, I hope you found it interesting hope you find it useful um, and yeah add comments drop me a line this has been another financial update speak to you soon bye bye